This is Lecture 10 on the Descriptive Statistics of the Relationship of Two Numerical Variables. <clears throat> uh, I want to start by thinking about what the data would look like if you have two numerical variables. Let's say, for example, that we're looking at the relationship between your high school GPA and your college GPA. Each individual would be represented by two numbers, high school and college GPA. So data would be a collection of pairs of numbers. Now you know how to visually represent pairs of numbers in mathematics. You graph them in xy coordinates. So the only thing that's noteworthy here about doing that is that our tradition is that we always make the explanatory variable the x variable that goes along the horizontal axis and the response variable the y variable which goes along the vertical axis. You can remember that because <clears throat> explanatory begins with the X sound, but you can also remember it by thinking about in mathematics, in algebra and calculus, you always think of Y as a function of X. That is to say you think of X varying and Y depending it, being determined by it. And that's very similar to the relationship between the response and the explanatory variable that the explanatory variable affects or influences the response variable. That graph of a bunch of x and y values marked in two dimensions is called a scatter plot. So here's an example. Suppose I'm looking at the relationship between how many hours a student studies on, and their score on a test. Uh, here's a very small data set. You can see hours studied in the first row and score in the bottom row. So there are five individuals in this sample. And of course, I'm going to think of hours studied as the explanatory variable and scores the response variable. I didn't say that explicitly, but of course, because the studying comes before the test, the only way an influence could happen is the hours of studying influencing the score on the test. And of course, it's very reasonable to expect that time spent studying is going to influence your score on the test. So that's very natural. Uh, so let's look at these points one at a time. The first individual didn't study at all. His hours studied is zero, and he got a score of 61. So we're going to plot that with a zero on the x-axis and a 61 on the y. So over zero and up 61. And I should point out here that I have set my scale on the x-axis to include all the values of the explanatory variable. It runs from zero to four. I've set my scale on the y-axis to include all the var values of the response variable. It goes from 60 to 90. Um, so notice the scales are determined by, respectively, the explanatory and the response variable. And notice that I left a gap down here um, because <clears throat> there would, it would take up too much empty space to put in all the numbers from 0 to 60, and all the data would be crowded into the very top third of the picture. It's a common thing to leave a gap like this. It's a thing to be careful of, because if you don't realize that, the end result is deceptive. So the next point, the next individual, is 1, 65. So we go over 1, sorry, 1, 85. We go over 1 and up 85, and we get to this point here and so on. We have a point at over 4 and up 91, over 2 and up 79, and over 2 and up 88. And there's our scatter plot. It's a very small scatter plot because we just have a little data. But already you can see visually something important about the relationship. On the graph, you see as you move from left to right, overall the dots tend to get higher and higher. So that suggests that when the x values are larger, the y values are also larger. In other words, people who study more get a higher score on the test. So that is the relationship. Of course, it's not a universal relationship. We see two people who study the same amount who got different scores. We see two people, one of whom studied more and got a worse score. But the overall trend, we can see that fact that it goes up as you move from the left to the right, is indicative of the fact that there is a positive relationship between hours studied and score. Uh, that's the first example of the 
set of terms we use to describe the visual aspects of the scatter plot, which are important. You remember we had a set of terms uh, like skew left, skew right, uh, bimodal, and so on to describe the shape of histograms. Here are terms to describe the shapes of scatter plots. So the first terms, they come in three dichotomies. The first one is positive versus negative. Positive means the overall trend is as you move from left to right, it goes up. Negative the overall trend is, as you move from left to right, it goes down. If you think about the slopes of lines, the left picture looks like something with a positive slope, and the right picture looks like something with a negative slope. And as in that example, this is indicative of the relationship between the variables. If it's a positive slope, that means in general, as x increases, y increases, and in general, in a negative relationship, as x increases, y decreases. And I have two examples here. The relationship between number of customers and total amount of sales, you would certainly expect to be positive. Each additional customer brings in more sales. On the other hand, uh, my second graph is my imaginary data of the relationship between how much you drink and your GPA. And you would expect that the more you drink, the lower your GPA. So you expect a negative relationship. Not only is it easy to tell at a glance whether a scatter plot reflects a positive or a negative relationship, it's usually easy to tell just from description of the variables which you would expect. The next dichotomy, pair of opposites, that we'll look at is a strong relationship versus a weak relationship. In a strong relationship, the points hew very closely to some underlying relationship. So you can think of them as scattered very tightly around some curve, with very little variation around that curve. Whereas on the right, you see a weak relationship where they're scattered very loosely around a curve or a line with a lot of variation. Um, my examples were the temperature outside and the amount of fuel a house is burning. Um, each additional degree requires a certain amount of fuel to, um, to warm the house up more, uh, and that you would not expect there to be a whole lot of variation there. You'd expect that to be a strong relationship. On the other hand, while you might think for similar reasons to the drinking that watching TV will tend to have a negative effect on your GPA because it uses up time you could spend studying, uh, you imagine that it's a pretty weak relationship because there are an awful lot of things besides time that go into GPA, and probably when you decide to spend time on TV, you're taking it mostly from other leisure activities. Okay, and finally, the last dichotomy is some relationships are curved, where the data is scattered around an underlying relationship that has curvature to it, or the data is linear, or the relationship, sorry, is linear, where the data is scattered around some underlying linear function. So my example of a linear relationship was, again, customers versus sales, because each additional customer you would expect would bring in the same average amount of sales, whether they're the first customer or the thousandth customer. Um, so that suggests a linear relationship, whereas the relationship between your age and your chance of dying is somewhat more complicated. In, in most societies, the chance of dying is non-trivial when you're a baby or an infant because you're so delicate. Then when you get well into childhood, teenage years, and young adult, it's extremely low. You're at your healthiest and your strongest, and then it gradually increases, and then increases very rapidly once you get old. So you can see that complicated shape here, which is a curved relationship. Now, we'll talk more in the next few slides about positive and negative, strong and weak, and how to measure them. Um, but we won't say much more about curved and linear relationships because from here on in, everything we do will assume the relationship is linear. The techniques we learn will only work for linear relationships, or relationships which are close enough to being linear. Um, so our typical approach to any problem when we're dealing with the relationship of two numerical variables will be to 
take a look at the scatter plot, confirm that the relationship is reasonably linear, and that we can use our techniques, and then get to work with our techniques. A reasonable question to ask here is, what do you do when you have a linear relationship between two variables? And there are two answers. One answer you may remember from calculus. In calculus, the general approach to dealing with curves, things which aren't straight, is to approximate them by straight lines. Any curve, if it's smooth, if you zoom in tightly enough, will begin to resemble a straight line. And the same is true here. If we restrict attention to a range of x values, say if we restrict the attention to this range here, which looks to me like it's the maybe 30 to 60 range, that data looks pretty linear. The range from 60 to 90 looks linear with a steeper slope. Uh, so if we break it up into pieces, each piece may be reasonably linear. Uh, that's a workable strategy, as long as you remember that that's what you've done, in, because uh, the danger there is once you do linear regression in a fixed range of x values, that you expect that relationship to continue outside that range. In general, you should never use any work we do looking at the linear relationship between variables, you should never try to apply it to values of x outside the range for which you have data. That's called extrapolating, and it can lead to some extremely embarrassing errors, uh, and it's because most relationships in real life are curved if you look at a large enough range of x values. The second strategy, which we will not pursue at all, but would be uh, central to a more detailed and advanced discussion of looking at the relationship between variables, is nonlinear regression, which is uh, mostly consists of applying uh, certain mathematical functions like the log to either the x or the y value or both to transform the data from a curved relationship to a linear. This is a very delicate business. It involves having a, an understanding, a model, of what the relationship should be between the variables, which suggests these functions, and the process of determining if you have successfully turned the relationship into something linear, uh, and if your decision about what function to use was right, is extremely delicate and rarely done correctly. Uh, we will not talk about this anymore, but it's a very important technique, which I hope you go on to learn more about. Okay, if, if the association is linear, we refer to it as a correlation. You may remember that I said the word correlation often gets used a little bit incorrectly to describe any association, but it's really only a linear association. We're going to compute a quantity called the coefficient of correlation, which measures both the sign of the relationship, that is positive or negative, what we called positive or negative in the last slide, and the strength, what we called strong and weak, but only for a linear relationship. The coefficient of correlation isn't telling you anything useful if the relationship is not linear. Uh, first, the terminology. The coefficient of correlation in the sample context, remember in sample context, we tend to use Roman letters, is called R. You would think it would be called C for something that's the coefficient of correlation, but it's called R. Uh, I believe for relation, but I don't actually know. And the population version of the coefficient of correlation is following the convention, referred to by the Greek letter rho, it's spelled R-H-O, it's pronounced Rho, and it looks like a script P, but in fact it's the ancestor of our R. And here's how the coefficient of correlation works. It's a number between minus 1 and 1, and it's, so half the values are positive, half of them are negative, and it's positive and negative according to whether the underlying relationship is positive or negative. So it's sign tells you the first of those dichotomies we looked at, positive versus negative. When r equals 0, there's no correlation. In effect, the variables are independent. Um, and when r is plus 1 or minus 1, the points fall on either a positive slope straight line or a negative slope straight line. They're perfect without variation along the line, 
and in between, how far r is from 0 measures the strength of the relationship. So from 0 to 1 goes from the weakest to the strongest positive correlation, and from 0 to negative 1 goes from the weakest to the strongest negative correlation. Here's some pictures. I apologize for the resolution here, but I will read the relevant things out loud. The first picture in the upper left-hand corner is data with r equals 0. And you can see there's no relationship here. As you move from left to right, the data points are scattered in the same way in the vertical dimension. They do not go up, they do not go down. It's just a cloud. To the right on the top line is data with an r of minus 0.3. I know the minus sign is hard or impossible to see. Minus 0.3 is a negative relationship, but it's a barely visible negative relationship. I think if you look carefully, you would agree that as you go from left to right, on average, the points go down a little, but only just a little, and it's hard to see to the naked eye. By the time you get to r equals 0.05, that's the third one, second row, first column, it's clear that there's a positive relationship. You do not doubt that as you go from left to right, overall the trend is up, but it's clearly a very weak one. So around 0.5, you get to visible but weak relationship. The next, second row, second column, is r is minus 0.7. Again, clearly visible, no question, and clearly stronger than 0.5. You'd probably still call this weak, maybe moderate. Third row, um, first column, r is 0.9, begins to look like a strong relationship. There's still a fair amount of variation, but there's no question that you should think of this as points scattered around a line. And finally, r equals minus 0.99. You see the points are almost on a line. The variation around the line is very tiny compared to the variation in y from as you go from left to right. You can think about r as relating the variation in y for a fixed x, say this quantity, to the variation in y as you go from the left to right end, from down here to up here. R is somehow measuring those relative sizes. All right, here's the formula for the coefficient of correlation. It's a kind of complicated formula, but if you remember z-scores, it's not too bad. The coefficient of correlation is the average of the product of the z-scores for the x variable and the z-score for the y variable. That is, the average is you sum up the z-score of each value, each x value, times the z-score of each y value, and you divide by how many there are. What are those z-scores? Well, remember, you take each point minus its mean, the mean for x values, there's also a mean for y values, minus its mean divided by its standard deviation. There's also a standard deviation in the x direction and a standard deviation in the y direction. So each of these is a perfectly sensible quantity, a z-score. You multiply them and then you average them. The idea here is that if both x and y are above average, both their z-scores will be po positive and the product is positive. If they're both below average, both their z-scores will be negative and the product will be positive again. So when they're both above or both below average, that is with the, when they're going in sync in a positive relationship, they add to the coefficient of correlation, whereas if one's positive and one's negative, they're going to subtract. And that's when they're acting as if they're in a negative relationship. Okay, that was the formula in the population context. Just as with the standard deviation, the formula is slightly different in the sample context. Slightly different in almost exactly the same way. We're still averaging the z-scores, although now we compute them in a sample context. So it's each value minus x bar divided by s of x, sample mean and standard deviation, and the same for y. But when we average them, we divide by n minus 1 instead of n. Just what we did for the standard deviation. Okay, I will not expect you to memorize those formulas. I will expect you to be somewhat comfortable with what they're saying. In fact, here's what I will expect you to be able to do.
After the lecture, you should know what a scatter plot is and what the coefficient of correlation is. You should be able to interpret scatter plots and use the terms strong, weak, positive, negative, and linear curved correctly. You should be able to estimate the coefficient of correlation, interpret the coefficient of correlation, and know its symbols, r and rho, and what the difference is, and estimate r very crudely from a scatter plot. And then, after we've worked together a little, you should be able to make a scatter plot and compute r in Excel. Um, I will never ask you to compute r by hand, uh, and would only ask you to make very simple crude scatter plots by hand. And you should be able, you should understand the meaning of the coefficient of correlation formula.